Okay. Okay, let's start the conference. So I'm pleased to introduce the first speaker of this conference, uh, Professor Shumel On from Israel Institute of Technology. And the title of talk is uh, Graver Base and Nonlinear uh, <coughs> Integer Programming in Polynomial Time. Okay, please. Okay, thank you and thank you for the invitation. Do you hear me well? Yes. So this is an honor to give the first uh, talk of this conference. I just arrived midnight yesterday, so I'm a little bit, I hope it's going to be fine. But uh, <laughs> So I'm going to tell you about the theory which we have been developing over the last three years, I think, of uh, we can actually solve hard integer programming problems in variable dimension in polynomial time. So let me remind you what integer programming is. Uh, I think everybody knows what this problem is, but it's a, uh, you are minimizing some or maximizing an objective function, possibly non-linear, over integer points, or so x is a vector of variables in n dimensions, and you have linear inequalities. And this is, in, you can always put it into this stand, standard form where you have a system of equations defined by a matrix A and a right-hand side vector B, and the lower and upper bounds on the vector or variables. And then there's this objective function from uh, Rn to R. So this is the general nonlinear integer programming problem. And it's, it's a very useful program. As, I, as I'm saying here, it uh, has generic modeling power. You can take your whatever problem you like, discretize the data. If you have some quantitative uh, I mean quantities and also some logical constraints, you can always write down quite easily uh, an integer program of this form. But the problem is that, uh, ah, so, and here is one example. So this is one example which I'm going to actually look on in close de detail later when I talk about applications. And I know many people here are interested in tables. So and it's generic in a well-defined sense, which I'll explain later. So look on tables like this one, three-dimensional tables, L by M by N and align some constraints. So a table means this such an array. The variables are now organized in this table. Each cube here is a, is a variable. So you have L times M times N variables. And you follow some equations. You, you, you want the table to be non-negative and integer. So you have lower bounds, which are non-negativity and integer variables. And uh, you follow some equations like line sum. So here I indicated this 8. You see the, the sum of the entries here, 3 plus 1 plus 4, should be 8. And you should have many line sums in all directions. I just indicated 3. You're going to have 4 times 6, 24 line sums from this direction, and then 12 from here, and so on. OK, so you get equations, non-negativity and integrality. This is, and you want to optimize over such tables, find the best table. And you can easily write down an integer program which looks like this. So here are your variables. X is non-negative, integer, table, L by M by N, and non-negativity. And these equations are the line sums in all directions. The I is one direction, J, K, and you minimize uh, an objective function. So easily you can write down an integer program for tables. And tables are going to play an important role later. But the problem is, of course, usually very hard to solve integer programming. It's NP-hard. Already, if the function is linear, everybody knows that. And so what can you do? So you can try and parameterize the integer programs. And the most natural way to do it is to fix the dimension. So you see, this is the dimension n. And throughout the talk, whenever I write a, a dimensional parameter like n in red, this means it's large and variable, and green and blue means fixed. So you can fix the dimension, and for each fixed dimension, there is a polynomial time algorithm. And this was found in the 80s by Lenstra. It's a, it's a nice and complicated algorithm. The problem is that in application, this is uh, quite limited, because you have, for example, in tables, you, then you stay with a fixed number of entries. So in application, it's not so good. And also, when you increase the dimension, the complexity is, becomes much larger. And what I'm going to describe here is something that, as I said, we have a series of papers uh, from the last three years or so that we developed a new theory of polynomial time solvable of broad and natural classes, in fact, universal in a sense that I'll describe later. 
of integer programs, we can actually solve in variable dimension in polynomial time. And the universal means that we somehow also have a different parameterization in a sense. Okay, so let me explain, start to explain this theory. And the uh, greater basis. Greater basis are going to play an important role here. So what is a greater basis? So I'll give the definition. If you haven't seen it, it's going to be hard to really see what it means, but uh, you just have to keep it in mind. <coughs> so we have, do you see the pointer, by the way? Is it visible? Yes. So we have a, an integer matrix. The graver basis of a matrix is a finite set of integer vectors in the kernel of the matrix. So you have an M by N matrix, and we are looking on vectors which gives you A times X equals zero, N dimensional integer vectors. And among those, we take those which are minimal in this order, and it's very simple to explain. Take the matrix, take all the integer vectors, the n-dimensional integer vectors in the kernel. On each orthant separately, you have two to the n orthants by the signs. On each orthant, you look on those which are closest to the origin in this order. And it turns out this is a finite set, uniquely defined from the matrix. It's a beautiful set. You give me an n by n integer matrix, I get a set of n-dimensional integer vectors, non-zero vectors, canonically defined from the matrix, and it's very nice and useful. Usually it's very hard and hard to compute, so this is the problem. But I'm going to show you we can actually use it. So here's just a quick example. Suppose this is my matrix, very simple one. Then the graver basis is going to consist of uh, three-dimensional vectors, right, of dimension three, which dot to zero of this matrix. And first of all, you get the so-called circuits, the minimal, those of minimal support, like two minus one. If you take two minus one times this, you get zero and so on, right? So these are always there, those with minimal support. But then you have some others also, non-circuits, like this one. This is not minimal support, but you need it in the graver basis because uh, it is closer to the origin in its order. None of these is below this in this order here, which is defined. So you need this. In general, you have many, many non-circuits. Most of the elements will be non-circuits. And just a brief connection to Grobner basis. This is a Grobner basis conference, but uh, so just in the background, because I'm not going to talk much about Grobner basis. Uh, but uh, probably many people here in the audience know this correspondence. If you have an integer vector, you can always make a binomial out of it. You take the positive part, you use it in exponent, you get monomial minus the negative part, and, and this is a connection. So if I take my graver basis, I look on all integer vectors. For which one of those I take the positive part, take this monomial, this is, this is now variables, x1 to xn, minus this monomial. You get a finite set of binomials. They form a so-called universal Grobner basis for the ideal which is generated, the so-called toric ideal of A, which is the ideal generated by all similar things where V runs through all vectors in the kernel. This is the connection. Just in this example, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. If you just look again on this example, for example, this one, if you look on this guy here, you see? I should get a, a binomial in three variables. So x1, positive times x3, positive, this is this x1, x3, minus the negative part, which is x2. And if you look on this guy, for example, you get x1 squared minus x2. This is a connection, and I'm not going to talk more about Grobner basis. The one thing I should say that Grobner basis usually computational are very hard to deal with. They are exponential, you need exponential time algorithms. What we do here, Whenever we are able to compute the graver basis in polynomial time, you can actually adapt this, get a universal Grobner basis in polynomial time for the corresponding toric ideals. And then there's a good project, which we have, we have not touched yet, to try and use our algorithmic results and compute whatever you want on a toric ideal. I don't know, primary decomposition, finite free resolution, whatever. Maybe you can get some polynomial time computation. Okay, so let me just start by the main results of, uh, of our theory. Uh, we have six, I'm going to give you, there are many variations, but we have six basic theorems on <coughs> nonlinear integer programming using the, uh, oops, using the Grobner basis, the Graver basis, and here is the first one. So, first of all, we can do linear. 
<coughs> linear optimization in polynomial time if we have the greater basis. So <coughs> this is a general integer program. It's NP-hard usually. You have equations, inequalities here, integrality, linear objective. In general, this is NP-hard. But if you have the greater basis as part of your input, you can do it in polynomial time. So this is the first result on this line of, uh, on, in this theory, 2008. But we can also do some nonlinear uh, optimization. So for example, you can, again, the same system, integer points, it's, it's a generic integer program, but the objective function now is we are maximizing some convex functions. In this form, a weighted form, FWX. So W is a D by N matrix. Uh, we take the vector variables and get a D-dimensional vector here and uh, apply F, which is a convex function on, on RD. And we can maximize this. This, of course, is more general than linear, right? Because if you take uh, one row here, and this is the identity, you get a linear objective. So this is more general. And we can maximize some convex objective function in polynomial time. This form is a nice interpretation that you can think about each row of the matrix as giving you one linear criterion or utility of a player, and then this F balances this, okay? But anyway, we can maximize in polynomial time uh, certain convex objective functions. This is nine, 2009. Then we can also minimize some convex objective function in polynomial time, minimize Again, you cannot hope to minimize uh, all convex functions, but uh, we can minimize so-called separable convex. Separable convex means that the uh, objective function is a sum of univariate convex function on the variables. Again, it's more general than linear because linear is just sigma wi xi. And again, this is, in general, this is a very hard problem, but we always assume now that we have the greater basis as part of the input. Okay, well, a special case of this, we can do projection, namely, if you give me a point, I can find the point, the feasible point, which is closest in some norm to the given green point. It's a special case of the previous one. We have more recent results. This is just submitted. Uh, we can do some quadratic uh, optimization. Uh, there's a certain cone here of matrices which is incomparable with the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. It's incomparable. So there are some matrices in this cone which are not, which are indefinite, and then we can optimize over, over this. Matrices in this cone, we can optimize the quadratic functions in polynomial time. This has extensions to arbitrary degree polynomials. So again, there's a certain cone of polynomials in degree D, let's say homogeneous, and then we can minimize in polynomial time integer programs with this objective function for every polynomial in this cone, provided we have the greater basis. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit rushing, but I have lots of uh, things to say here. So I hope uh, with the video and the slide you can, and um, all the papers, I'll mention this in the end, give reference, everything is on my homepage basically. Uh, so is, uh, is there any question on the statements of the theorem? I mean, just not to lose. So when you say polynomial time, so what with respect Polynomial, the input is going to be the natural input, A, the matrix A, L, U, and the objective function encoded suitably, and the greater basis for the time being. And I'm soon going to get rid of this also. So soon, I'm, this is the general, now, the graver basis is part of the input, and it's polynomial time in this. Usually the graver basis is very large. So after I finish the proofs of this theorem, I'm going to specialize, again, to a class which is universal, and then we are going to be able to compute the graver basis directly, and it's not going to be part of the input anymore. Okay, so let me just quickly outline some of the proofs of some of this theorem. Let's look on the minimizing a convex function. This is a convex function, I want to minimize it. And we need two lemmas. The first lemma is a, a certain supermodularity condition. I'm not going to describe this too much. This follows directly from the convexity. Basically tells you that if you have a point and some points in the same orthant, then the function increases faster if you add all the points first than if you add them one by one. And that's quite easy. This is, so this is a, 
mathematical lemma which is easily followed from the convexity and, and we call it so in, in short a separable convex function is supermodular satisfies this condition then we have an algorithmic lemma which is again not so complicated uh, it concerns univariate minimization in, the, in a given direction so and the idea is the following we are going to have an iterative algorithm at each time I'm going to have some feasible point x lower and upper bound objective function and I want in a direction g where I want to try and go and improve so I, I, I'm trying to replace my point x by a better point x plus alpha g where g is the direction and alpha is some parameter and I want to find the best alpha so this is a univariate minimization problem where alpha the step size is this thing I'm trying to minimize over uh, and you can easily do this again in polynomial time so once we have these two lemmas let me just sketch the algorithm uh, I mean if you get lost now I mean I'm soon going to finish with the proofs and then later there are going to be some applications mostly for tables or you know for those that can follow the, uh, this rough outline the output step size should be integer right? integer, integer step size yes and this is just by binary search because it's universe very simple you just do binary search basically so it's not complicated now I want to minimize this uh, really integer program convex separable function again this is usually NPR unless I have the greater basis as part of my input and this picture it tells you this is the function the yellow points are the integer points the, this is the convex hull but we don't see it you see we see this transparent weak thing which is the, given by the inequalities so it's a kind of hard problem and now we have the graver basis that's our advantage and so what we do first of all we have to find some initial point you see this green point here find some initial feasible point and for this we have to set an auxiliary program and again we have to apply the same machinery it's a hard problem but we can do it in polynomial time and this is kind of reminds of the phase one of the simplex method if you know what this is but here we can do it in polynomial time so we find a feasible point and then we want to try and start improving it you see this arrow here so the idea is going to the following for every vector in this graver basis every g which is an n-dimensional vector we try to find the best step we can go by the pre previous lemma lemma 2 that I mentioned we can try to find the best step along this direction and we do this for every element in the graver basis and we take the best among all of those and then we go there and we keep going all the way we keep doing this iteratively and then using the supermodularity and something called the integer cartel dory theorem we can show that in polynomial time we converge to the optimal solution this is the first proof now a very special case is linear optimization linear functions are of this form they are separable and so we can optimize in polynomial time linear we can do linear integer programming in polynomial time if we have the greater basis let me very briefly describe uh, the, the proof of the convex maximization so I want to maximize now <clears throat> I want to maximize and we have a lemma here that says that if you can do linear optimization over a set of integer points we can also maximize these functions but this is too good to be true right it's not, it cannot be I mean this is a harder problem so we need some condition and this is the condition so we can amplify linear optimization to convex maximization if we are lucky and the convex hull of the integer point you see this is the, these are the integer points this is the convex hull if we have few directions which catch all edges so every edge here is parallel to one of these directions you see the blue direction there are six edges one two three four five six in general you may have exponentially many 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 edges but few directions if we have such a set of edge directions as part of the input we can do maximization and now we combine this with what I had before and I can maximize in polynomial time over integer points in the following way I, give, I get a set of integer points and the greater basis then first of all it will, it's a miracle the greater basis is a set of edge directions for the convex hull here so we use this in the, so that's one way we use the greater basis then you can use it to do linear optimization over the set 
as we just saw from the first theorem. And we can do it repeatedly. We need to do it many times using this, this lemma. Here we need to do the linear optimization many, many times to be able to solve one convex maximization. So we apply the lemma and do it. OK, so I know it's a little bit fast. I'm, well, you can see the papers. On. So let me go to, uh, before the applications, let me now go to use this result for a very important class of, uh, of integer programs, which we call n-fold integer programming. N-fold integer programming. So what is n-fold integer programming? <coughs> so so in general, just to summarize what I said before, we can do linear and nonlinear integer programming in polynomial time if we have the so-called graver basis of the defining matrix. That's all you need from here on, OK? So what is n-fold integer programming? <coughs> well, the basic operation is the following, what I call the n-fold product of a bimatrix. So we start with a small matrix. A1, A2 is, are two blocks. This is one matrix. And I call it a bimatrix A. So it has a, okay, an RS by T by matrix is something which has two blocks. This has R rows, S rows, and T columns together. And given any positive integer N, I form this big matrix where I copy the first block N times here, and the second block N times on the diagonal, and the rest are zeros. And the idea is that this small matrix is going to be small and fixed always. I mean, arbitrary, but fixed. But this big matrix is very big. This N here is red, it's variable, it's a large matrix. And we are going to solve integer program with such a matrix, such a defining matrix. So here is, a, a, here is the key lemma here. That if we fix the small by matrix A, then given N, we can in polynomial time, and polynomial just in N, this is the only input here, compute the graver basis of this bigger matrix. Okay, fix this small matrix here. <clears throat> you give me any N, I can compute this, this set in polynomial time. This again is a set of vectors, large vectors in the kernel of this matrix. I can, can do it in polynomial time, polynomial in N. And the proof uses a nice sequence of results, which actually started from work of uh, our hosts here, uh, Aoki and Takemura on tables. They looked on three by three uh, by n tables and then three by four by n tables and observed a certain phenomenon. And then uh, uh, Santos and Sturmfels generalized it, and uh, Hosten, which is also here, and Sullivan generalized this further. And this is the base for this, uh, the proof of this uh, result. So now if I combine this lemma and the previous theorems, I can actually solve in genuine polynomial time for your question on the input, uh, all these problems I mentioned before. And actually a good reference is a, uh, an overview paper which I've recently written, 35 pages. It's on my web page, Theory and Applications of N-fold Integer Programming. And uh, you can linear, do linear optimization in polynomial time if the matrix is an N-fold product. Now you don't need the greater basis anymore. So the input is simply L, U, B given in binary, and this little matrix A is fixed and N. You can do it in polynomial time. You can do weighted convex maximization polynomial time, separable convex minimization polynomial time. Everything I said before, you can do in polynomial time, provided you, your matrix is an n-fold matrix like this. And the proof is now simple. You just use the previous lemma to compute in polynomial time the graver basis, and then use this using all the theorems I showed before to solve this in polynomial time. There are some other extensions, but let me move to applications because I think my time is really running short here. So tables, let me talk about tables. <clears throat> so I know many people here like tables, statistics, and actually the tables was the trigger for all the development of this theory, really. And so let's look on this specific case. I mean, three-dimensional di three tables, line sums, as before, L by M by N. And now, uh, let me ask you, what is the complexity of just deciding if there is a table? I give you L, M, and N, and the line sums from all directions. Is there a non-negative integer tables with these line sums? Well, there are four 
situations according to the parameters. So red means variable. So the hardest situation is where all the dimensions are variable and large. L, M, N are red, variable. This is the hardest situation. The easiest is when all are fixed. Here you have two variables, one fixed, one variable, two fixed. So the complexity is going to, of course, be, you know, it's harder from the top, becomes easier as we go down. And if I start from above, this is really a classical NP-complete problems, three-dimensional matching, already in CARP's original 72 paper on completeness. What about the bottom one? Can you guess? This is the easiest, so obviously if there's something interesting going on, this will be solvable in polynomial time. How can you solve this in polynomial time? If L, M, and N are fixed, the number of variables is L times M times N is fixed. Fixed dimension, this is Lenstra. Ten years later, Lenstra's algorithm, you can solve this in polynomial time, but know that even if you fix the number of variables, like here, you have uh, 12 times 6, you have 72 variables, it's still a hard problem, and this algorithm is non-trivial at all. So now let's look on this harder situation, where you have two variables and one fixed. Well, anybody knows the answer? Well, there's some intersection with my previous talk here in, in the audience from last, uh, the last conference. Uh, we resolved it so... In the first Gobner Basis Conference in 2005, actually, I, part of my talk was devoted to this universality situation. If your table has two sides variable m by n, like a matrix and fixed number of layers, maybe just three layers, then it's already universal. Not only it's np hard, np complete, but also any integer program is one of those. So this is a very hard problem. And then after this conference five years ago, 2006, you know, we figured this out. And the, the, this other case was really, we didn't know what to do with this other case. It was not clear if it's going to be polynomial time or not. And so the tables were actually triggered for this theory in a sense. And you can guess now, you have a hint. There's one red N. So what can it be? Well, it's an n-fold integer program. So this is a consequence of this linear n-fold integer programming 2008. Uh, so we can do it in polynomial time now. And this is very important. This is really a very important result, all this theory. So let me just sketch how it goes. Wow. Uh, so again, look on much more general. Any table of any dimension, m1 by m2 by mk by n, and now we have margins, not necessarily line sums. You can have plane sums, all sorts of things. And this Multi, so-called multi-index transportation problem was studied already by Motskin in, in the 50s, 60 years ago. And of course, he didn't have uh, this red and blue here. I mean, this is my notation, because now we know that there's a significant difference if you let one side vary. So Motskin just said M1, MK, MK plus 1. Now we put this red N, this is the only variable one, then we can solve this in polynomial time. All sort of optimization, linear and non-linear optimization. And the thing is, this is just an n-fold program. And again, you have to think about it a little bit, but you can write the table problem as an n-fold program in this way, non-negativity, integer, tables, your objective function. And the system is an n-fold system like this, where the first block you see you sum, this gives you the summation of margins over layers that involve margins in this direction, vertical direction, and layers. And this A2 gives you a separate equation on each layer itself. You see this? I think this is clear, the intuition, right? That's the thing. You see, that's the, that's the main thing. You see the fold program here. The A2, the blocks, give you one similar equation on each layer. And uh, the A1 gives you the vertical one. So you get an n fold program, you can apply this theory that I showed, and you solve it in polynomial time. Uh, so you can do linear optimization, universality. If you have two sides variable, then it's hopeless. Every integer program. Okay, so this is a good application. I have to run. I have, I have to start uh, <clears throat> accelerating. I have to. I'm going to 40, right? So well, there's some application for privacy. There are lots of experts here, uh, Steven Feinberg, there are many exper experts here on privacy which know much more about this than I do. But we are just interested in the computation. I'm going to skip this. Uh, 
So, uh, well, maybe, maybe I should. Uh, so, uh, okay, maybe I should say a little bit. So, there's a common strategy in, in web disclosure of sensitive data. You release margins, but not the table entries. And the philosophy, again, I'm not going to, uh, it's a huge area with lots of various ways of explaining things, but just algorithmic lo looking on one entry and asking what is the possible set of values that can occur in all tables with the same margins, this has something to do with the privacy. Because if the entry is unique, for example, you release the margin, then your adversary, if it has a, a large computation power, can recover the entry, right? And so, uh, on my previous talk here, I mentioned that we can actually, every finite set of non-negative integers can be encoded as the set of uh, values in an entry, and in particular, can get things like gap here. But now, using the L4 integer programming theory, we can actually compute in polynomial time the set of values in any entry, provided the tables are long in one side. But if you have three by four by five by a hundred table, you can in polynomial time compute all the values that can occur in an entry. And you just iteratively minimize and maximize over the entry you, using n fold integer programming and uh, you keep incrementing the bounds and you can do it. So this is a really, this are, tables is a very important application area of this theory. There are some other applications which I'm really going to rush through. Transportation problem with non-objective function we can solve multi-commodity flow problem with many consumers in polynomial time because again this is an n-fold integer program so we can do it in polynomial time we can do some stochastic integer programming uh, this is a this is a well-studied model where some of the data is random and the cost function involves some expectation over some random cost again complicated issue here the situation is more difficult so when you do it, we actually the system becomes an, a transpose of an n-fold program. And then the graver basis cannot be computed in polynomial time. It's a harder problem. But you can do some extra work and use some other stabilization results. Actually, Diane McLagan here is responsible for some of this. And then we can also uh, do this in polynomial can solve stochastic integer programs in polynomial time. So this is, so what the last thing I want to really talk about is universality. So n fold integer programming looks like a very specific uh, set class of problems. You have this sparse matrix there, this matrix, right? It looks like a very specific kind of program. But I want to show you that every integer program is an n fold program in some sense. So look on this again, this n fold product, but now a specific situation where I have a matrix and I put the identity on top of it. This is a special n fold specialization of this operator. And specifically, we are going to look on n-fold products of this kind, of this fixed small one by one by one, 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 one matrix, always. Like this one, so one, 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 three-fold product of this kind is this. You see, you take one, 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 one here, put the identity, and copy this three times. This thing for every M here is simply the incidence vector of the bipartite graph 3 by M. It's a simple, simply structured matrix. 0, 1, very nice. And now the universality theorem tells you that every integer program is a program of this form. Non-negative integer variables, equations, the information gets in the right hand side, and the matrix that defines the system is always the n-fold product of the n-fold product of 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, so you take, you take any integer program or any rational polytope and you lift it up to this. And this allows you, give you some schemes for doing arbitrary nonlinear integer programming. And I should say one thing is very important. So let me actually stand here and emphasize this. Whenever you fix M, the blue one, this becomes a fixed matrix, by matrix. And your integer program is now an n-fold integer program over this matrix. So every integer program that falls into this with a fixed M, you can solve in polynomial time. And when you vary M, you get all integer programs. So the M gives you a different parameterization of integer programming, different than the fixed dimension. 
But whenever you fix it, you get lots of interesting problems, like table problems with one side n, which have variable dimension. So this is a universal class. So let me just conclude by uh, what I call an epilogue on nonlinear. So the theory is a special case of something even broader, nonlinear discrete optimization. Uh, so we, in general, we minimize or maximize an objective function of this form, say, over integer points. And there are two branches for this general nonlinear discrete optimization theory. The first branch is integer programming, where S is a set of integer points given by inequalities. This is what I talked about throughout the talk, integer programming. But sometimes your set S is different. Let's say usually in, this is called combinatorial optimization. You have a set of points which is 0, 1 valued. They usually encode some combinatorial structure. And they are not given by inequalities, but by, say, from some graph, compactly through a graph or by some oracle. This leads to a different branch of the theory. And we also have many results in this direction. Let me mention one of them. So just because, again, this has to do with some people in the audience here. Uh, <laughs> so if S is a matroid, a set of uh, bases of a matroid, then we can do this in polynomial time, this nonlinear program, and this has some nice applications to experimental design. Design, so this is joint work with uh, Evary Comanio, which is here, and Henry Wynn, which is here, which I'm going to talk later on uh, in the conference, and also with our students, former students. So this is my former student, Yael Bershon, she graduated last year, and Hugo Maruri Aguilar is Henry and Eva's student who graduated longer ago, maybe three years ago or so. Uh, and then we have some extensions for method intersections, but then it's harder, so we can just do randomized polynomial time. Independent system, this is a very general uh, class of problems, and then you can just approximate this. And uh, so let me just conclude by references here. So I, I covered kind of lots of papers that are all available on my homepage. In particular, the theory of an application of n fold integer programming is a good survey of the theory of integer programming. And more generally, I just completed a, a recent monograph. So, and this is actually going to appear soon, I hope. Uh, Nonlinear discrete optimization, it's 150 pages. It's going to appear in the Zurich Lecture in Advanced Mathematics, European Mathematical Society. I talked about this in, uh, I gave a course in Zurich uh, last year on this. So I hope uh, it's going to be interesting. The European Mathematical Society is a non-profitable uh, publisher, so they try to keep the price down. Uh, I get no royalties from this. So. <laughs> Nothing, no penny. So I hope you get uh, the book, and it's going to be out soon. They are working on these files these very days. Okay, so thanks again for the invitation. Okay, we have a on this talk. Okay, sure. I want to understand something. So you say that in the time, the variable is solved on any n, on any n matrix? Yes, yes. Yes. If you start, if the bi matrix is small and fixed, and you give me n, I compute in polynomial time the greater basis of the n fold matrix. No, no, because I, I start with a fixed by matrix, the small one, A1, A2 is fixed, once and for all. Okay, so, you know, if A1 is the either n by n identity matrix, and A2 is an arbitrary d by n matrix. No, but not n by n, d by d. It cannot be n. It's fixed. The A1, A2 should be fixed, and then you have the n. You see? Yeah. I, okay, okay. The po of course, there's universality. So as I said, any integer program eventually is some n-fold. But then this little a is also going to be variable. So there's a delicate issue. I mean, if you're not uh, used to computational complexity, you may miss this. But uh, there's an issue. If, so whenever you fix a1, a2, you, you want to work. You like tables, right? So you want to work with 3 by 4 by 3 by 20 tables. And let's say the three by four by three, I, I don't know, the three indexes some, you know, some health parameters, so normal, below normal, uh, above normal, and maybe yes, no, uh, you know, healthy, sick. 
And then the n may be an age group. So the age group, you maybe want every two years. So you maybe you want 50 age groups there. Then you can do it efficiently, fairly efficiently, in terms of the 50, the large size of the table. And I should actually, I should say that the, the running times are, are very large. I mean, even for 3x4, this has to do with the Aoki Takemura results. If you look on 3x4 by, by n table, 3x4 by, by n, you have one parameter which varies, and 3x4. Then the running times are polynomial, but they are something like n to the 27. And we actually, we don't even know if it's 27. Maybe larger than 27. But this is polynomial time. And the large exponent just give, tells you that this is something very deep is going on here. And also there is hope that maybe there's some, we are missing something and there's a way, direct way to find an easy algorithm for this. It's a good indication, theoretical tool that tells you that you can do it in polynomial time. And also there's, a, I mentioned this scheme, and in, in my monograph you'll find it, there's a whole section on this. Uh, there's a natural strategy here of heuristic. You can fix some parameter, instead of doing n to the 27, you can do n to the cube, do something, some approximation of the greater basis, try to optimize as much as you can until you get stuck. And you get a solution and you don't know if it's good enough or not. So if you are happy, you stop. If you're not, you increase the parameter to 4, you run n to the 4 time procedure, you get a better solution and so on. And if you go up all the way up to, n to the 27, you know for sure that you are going to get the optimal solution in polynomial time. So this, I think there's also hope for really practical computational breakthrough here. To be able to approximate in fast time large problems. So, any more? Okay, another question or comment? Okay, thanks again, speakers, for your